Hello and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update for the Town of Plymouth. I am not Steve Trifletti. I'm Matt Miratori, State Representative for the 1st Plymouth District, including Plymouth. And we are here every Wednesday at noontime for this update. This forum is being brought to you by live by PAC-TV on Comcast Channel 15 and Verizon Channel 47. You can also watch this on PAC's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email PlymouthInfo at pactv.org. These forums can be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants include the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Ken DeVaris, Dr. Phil Trifoletti, MD at BID Plymouth, Dr. Barry Potvan, Professor Emeritus, Yeshiva University, Department of Biology, Dr. Stacy Rogers, Director of Special Education for Plymouth Public Schools, Heather Cosby, Plymouth CPA, Michael Jackman, District Director of Massachusetts Congressman William Keating, Amy Naples, Executive Director of the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, and my good friend and colleague, Kathy Lenatra, State Representative out of Kingston. Today, we're going to start off with Ken DeVaris to start us uh, with your update, Ken. Ken, today right, we also, uh, the governor yesterday signed uh, the new uh, updated regulation with regards to the mail-in ballots. So we're going to be able to do mail-in ballots through the end of June 30th now. So I think it's important that the people of Plymouth know that, that we extended that, uh, that law until June 30th. Good afternoon, Matt, and uh, thank you for filling in today. Uh, you certainly uh, know Steve Tripoletti because we know Steve Tripoletti. <laughs> I just uh, also want to uh, congratulate you on the appointment to the Ways and Means Committee for the House. Uh, that, that's an honor and a very important committee, so best wishes uh, as you begin that new work. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to borrow some words today because I think they're very important and actually sum up so much of what we need to do in the next several months. On Monday, I was listening to Dr. Michelle Walensky, the CDC director, and she made a plea, and I'm going to repeat it because it, I think it's that important uh, to be emphasized again. She started out by saying, I am pleading with you not to stop taking precautions. And just think of that, I am pleading with you. There is so much work that we have to do. We keep talking about the light at the end of the tunnel and things are improving, but also at the same time, we need to be reminded how fast they can shift. So I'm going to join Dr. Walensky and say, I'm pleading with you, do not stop taking precautions. It is saving lives. And we all have responsibility for that. So again, uh, thank you uh, for listening and just keep taking those precautions. Thank you, Matt. That's great advice, Ken. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're going to go, we got some breaking news from the, uh, the governor's office. He just finished a press conference and I'm going to ask uh, State Representative Kathy Lenatra, who by the way, has also uh, been appointed to Ways and Means as well. So. Uh, so we have this whole region really sewn up with uh, folks on the House Ways and Means. But Kathy, you got some news from the governor you want to talk about? I do have some news. Thanks. Breaking news from the governor. Today, the Baker Polito administration announced the timeline for all remaining residents to be eligible for the vaccine. They also announced the weekly distribution of the vaccine doses statewide for providers and a new $24.7 million investment in the administration's vaccine equity initiative. The dates that are remaining residents, the remaining residents in certain worker groups will be eligible for a vaccine were announced. Detailed timeline adheres to the original timeline for the three phases announced in December. All residents can pre-register to book an appointment at a mass vaccination site at mass.gov forward slash COVID vaccine. Appointments will be offered based on eligibility and available appointments nearby. It is expected that more sites will come online as part of the pre-registration process in April. So starting March 22nd, residents 60 years and over and certain workers that you'll find on the website will be eligible for vaccine. Starting April 5th, residents 55 and over and residents with one certain medical condition will be 
eligible for the vaccine and starting April 19th, which I think concludes us, Matt, the general public ages 16 years of age and older will be eligible for a vaccine. So the full timeline is available again on the website, which is mass.gov forward slash COVID vaccine phases. The administration has also received assurances from the federal government that an increased vaccine supply will be available to states soon. Depending on the supply, it could still take weeks for people to be notified that an appointment is available. So again, patience is still part of the game. Great, thank That's you so it much. That's for our Kathy. breaking news, Matt. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that update. Now we're gonna go to uh, Dr. Phil Trifoletti from BID. Um, Phil, what do you think about this, this news from the governor? With, it sounds like more vaccines are coming. Yeah, it's very exciting. I, I did notice uh, in doing research for t today's broadcast that you know we have been getting increasing allotments from the federal government so that's that's wonderful news for massachusetts and all the states and uh you know um you know talking about pleading and the light at the end of the tunnel and i'm, I'm going to start by still focusing on the light at the end of the tunnel i'll do the pleading at the end but uh you know i, I think there's a lot of reason for optimism uh here in massachusetts as well as nationally but there's still you know, my theme is that there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and so I, you know, I'm gonna reinforce that theme a little bit as I uh, you know, go through. Um, the first thing I'd like to update people on, I, I enjoy looking at you know, what is going on globally with infections, what's going on nationally, and then I like to you know, take it down to what's going on in Massachusetts with infections. And so, uh, you know, so far globally we've lost 2.67 million people have died globally of, of COVID infection. And you know, I'm sure that's probably an underestimate, um, you know, when you think of the global abilities to you know, track all of these things. Um, I'm sure in, in the United States, we're doing very well, but probably not in some other parts of the world. Um, when you look at the number of infections per day, you know, we've, in, in recent weeks when we've had our broadcast, it's been well over 500,000. So, you know, the numbers are coming down. It's down at about 400,000 infections globally per day. That's still, you know, very high number from where we would like to get to. Uh, you know, we'd like to see those global numbers come down substantially. When you look at the, the national numbers, we've had 534,000 deaths in the United States. Uh, so that those numbers unfortunately continue to climb. Um, but we're seeing Unlike um, the global numbers, uh, we're seeing a decline in the 14-day average. Uh, here in um, the United States, we're, we're down to about 53,000 infections per day. And there was a point where we were up around 70,000 or more um, in recent weeks. So we're continuing to see declines. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci has talked about us plateauing a little bit in terms of the decline, but you know we're still seeing some decline in the number. Um, and we'd like to see that get substantially lower too here in the United States. Um, if you're following the news, in, you see on CNN, they show the map of how many states are seeing increasing numbers of infections. And uh, the map today shows uh, 14 states in the country right now are showing in increasing infection. So it's a bit of a concern and something we have to continue to watch very, very carefully. Uh, you know, thankfully, Massachusetts is not one of those states. When we look at uh, what's going on with vaccinations, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about some of the news coming from Europe about uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. There's been some concerns expressed about whether or not there's an increased risk of blood clots um, associated with the vaccine. and you know, from what I'm reading so far, I think that they said they would have some more uh, definitive information released tomorrow. But uh, thus far, I think the analysis they've done, they've not been able to show any uh, clear relationship between the vaccine and, and increased risk of blood clots. Although uh, there are several countries now in Europe that are uh, put the AstraZeneca vaccine on hold. So uh, more information will be coming forward in future days. Of course, we're not using AstraZeneca vaccine here in the United States. Um, there's been no uh, reports here of any problems with the vaccines that we are using in terms of blood clots, but obviously we wanna 
stay attentive to that. But we do want to follow the science and you know, make sure that we don't, um, you know, inappropriately stop using tools that we know uh, can be effective and safe. <clears throat> when you look at what's going on with uh, vaccinations nationally, um, today, uh, the number of uh, people who are fully vaccinated in the United States is 11.8%. Um, that's uh, about 110 million people have received uh, at least, uh, you know, one shot. Uh, and uh, that's about 21% of the U.S. population has received at least one shot. So that's, you know, that's nice to see that number climbing. Uh, but, you know, obviously, again, a lot more work to do. You know, we want that number to basically be 80%. So, so we've got a lot more uh, vaccinations to do. Um, another news item that came up in the past week, there was an announcement the last few days that Moderna will be conducting some trials on younger children. So I think that that's great news um, for looking at the opportunity to use the vaccines in, um, in the, the younger age groups. Uh, right now, the limit is age 16. In Massachusetts, we've given now 2.6 million doses of vaccine and uh, 946,000 of uh, the va vaccines represent people who are, have either received two doses of Moderna or Pfizer or received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is one dose. So that represents um, about 25% of our population in Massachusetts has gotten at least one dose of vaccine, which is wonderful. And uh, we're doing very well compared to other states in terms of our vaccinations per capita. And uh, we now have, I've estimated about 14% of our state is fully vaccinated. So, you know, it's great to see those numbers continue to climb. But as I said, we've got a, a lot of work to do, you know, to get to that 80% uh, herd immunity that we'd like to see. So. Um, you know, uh, hope people will continue to, you know, seek out the vaccine. Um, as Catherine just uh, mentioned, you know, the state is now going to be opening all vaccines to all age groups as of April 19th. Uh, starting on Monday, there'll be additional groups available that are currently not available. Uh, some essential workers, you know, recently we've added teachers, uh, you know, to our uh, phase two uh, vaccination groups. So you know, we're seeing more and more ability to get everyone vaccinated. I, I did look at some of the vaccine trends, which I thought were quite interesting. Um, you know, there's a, a little bit of a difference by gender. Uh, about 50% more women are getting vaccinated than men. And when you look at uh, health care uh, and the willingness of people to, you know, take health care services, you know, it's well known that women you know, better utilizers of healthcare than men. So men are falling behind again. Um, and hopefully, you know, that can be one of our uh, targets for focus going forward is, you know, trying to get more men vaccinated. Um, when you look at uh, some of the racial disparities, you know, we do see here that, uh, you know, whites are getting higher percentages of vaccines than other racial groups. And, but we are doing better than, uh, most other states in terms of racial disparities, but I know a lot of what's gone on in terms of vaccine planning, you know, is targeting some of these racial disparities. You know, interestingly, um, you know, most of the vaccines that have been given thus far in the state have been given by hospital systems and pharmacies, about two thirds of all vaccines. And I think part of the reason uh, Attorney General Healy wanted us to continue with some of those programs was because some of the hospitals were you know, particularly targeting, um, you know, communities that um, had more problems with racial disparity. And uh, so, so that's a good, been a good thing, I think, you know, continue with the, some of those programs and hopefully we'll even, even out those gaps as time goes by. I did want to mention just briefly, uh, you know, Kathleen had mentioned about the pre-registration process, which was put in place last week. And so that, I think that's another major uh, upgrade to our electronic system on mass.gov for people um, and several hundred thousand people, I think it was about 400,000 took advantage of that last Thursday and Friday to pre-register in, in the past, uh, you, you could only book available appointments, but now you can put your name in as a placeholder to get an appointment when an appointment becomes available. 
and that's something we've been doing in our, our hospital system as well. Um, and I think that's a great way. Uh, the pre-registration, my understanding, is still only good for the mass vaccination sites. It's not good for all vaccination sites. But you know, I encourage people to to use the pre-registration if you want to just get your name in um, and 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 be on basically a waiting list to get your your vaccine. So I think that's great. Um, just a very brief note on, again, thinking about the hesitancy that people have. I've said this many times and I'm gonna say it over and over again. It still appears that one of the best sources of information to convince people to take their vaccine would be talking to their primary care doctor, talking to their pharmacist, you know, talking to these health profession professionals in their own communities that they know and trust well. And so I would highly recommend if you if you know anybody who is reluctant to take the vaccine, you know, have them suggest, you know, talk to their doctor, talk to their pharmacist about, you know, how safe and effective these vaccines are. And they can also discuss any other concerns they might have. Of course, there's no live ingredients in these vaccines, so you cannot get infected from the vaccine. And they did not skip any steps in terms of guaranteeing that these things were done, you know, safe safely and that we have an effective vaccine. The F FDA was, you know, I think very, uh, very careful about these things. Um, so um, I would advise at this point, you've been hearing it from a number of experts. If you listen to the media, if you get the opportunity to take a shot, take any one of the shots, you know, take Moderna, take Pfizer, take Johnson & Johnson. They're all equally effective, basically 100% effective for preventing hospitalizations or deaths, which is the main thing we're trying to do with these vaccines. So try not to be confused about other things you hear about the effectiveness. They're all uh, extremely effective for uh, the main thing, which is you know, making sure you don't get very sick. So uh, with that, I'm going to um, turn the microphone back over to Matt and uh, you know, our next guest on the program, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thanks for having me today, Matt. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil, and gr great advice for people. Appreciate that. And as Dr. Phil said, he's going to be here at the end, and all our panelists will be here at the end. So if you have any questions, please email us now at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. Our next panelist is the Chair of the Board of Health for the Town of Plymouth, Dr. Barry Potman. Barry, what do you have for us today? Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, in honor of the day, let me wish you a top of the morning to you, <laughs> just to make sure everybody realizes it really is St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can using a screen share with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so hopefully this will speed me up a little bit. Um, this is just some updates. Uh, it's sort of data driven. You can see if you look down at the bottom of this. Um, can everybody see this? I hope. Just shake your head. Yes, if you can. Okay. Um, Plymouth has been yellow now for two weeks and our numbers are going down. So yes, I, I do have some positive good news contained in the kind of things I'm bringing you up to date with. Uh, we're down to, as of the last report on Thursdays, 156 um, average daily positive cases. Um, and act, actually the number is 17.8 and a positive test rate of 3.13. And if you were to look at um, this, let me see if I can get this going. This is the same graph I show you periodically um, every time I come on the show. And you notice that way over on the right, it shows considerably a steep decrease. There may be a little bit leveling off going on, but in Plymouth, at least, we're seeing a decrease in the average daily case rate, which is a positive sort of thing. And we're still in the low risk, uh, no, the moderate risk category, um, have been for two weeks. As you can see in, in the state of Massachusetts, similar thing has been happening. Um, and the number of red communities, which are high risk, have fallen now to 19 out of 351. Um, this is the newest data that I could find about the variants that are popping up. The UK variant that you've been hearing, hearing about a lot has now been found in 371 cases in five of those from Plymouth County. The South African variant has been found in 10 cases statewide. I'm not sure how many of those, if any, are in Plymouth County. The Brazilian variant is just one case so far, and it is from Bonstable County um, and a woman who is 30 years of age. 
And there's a new one people haven't probably heard much about yet called the New York variant. And there's 735 cases for that in the US. Again, not sure if any of those are in the state, um, but it would make sense, some would be since we're so close to New York. All of these four and others as well from California are probably at least two times more infectious and easily transmitted than the original strain that we were dealing with. The UK strain is thought to be predominant in the next month or so. And so a lot of the new cases are gonna be caused by that. The Brazilian strain has been shown to be able to reinfect people who had previously recovered from infections with the common strain. And all these variants now account for 51% of the new cases in New York City, which is a rather troubling number. This is um, what's been going on in the US. You can see that they've now seen 4,686 cases of the UK variant in all 50 states. Um, the Brazilian variant is 142 in about half the states and the Brazilian variant is 27 in the US in about 12 of the um, states that have been reported. So you wanted good news, I'm trying to show you some good news. Um, good news is what's supposed to be happening on March 22nd in addition to um, getting the 60 plus and older group and those who are in essential work workers um, eligible for the vaccine. You can see that um, if it's approved by the governor and the numbers still look good, indoor and outdoor stadiums, arenas and ballparks can have 12% capacity. Overnight camps will be able to open the summer. Exhibition and convention halls will open. Dance floors can open for weddings and events only. And the gathering limits for event venues will be relaxed. So you can have 100 people inside and 150 outside. And in your backyard, uh, you can still have 25 outdoors and 10 indoors. And since I'm not gonna hover over the negative stuff, I'll skip the ones that are not allowed to reopen. Um, this is the up-to-date cases in the US, Massachusetts and Plymouth. Um, you can see the numbers. I'm just gonna skip down to the ones in Plymouth. Um, that's as of yesterday at 5 p.m., 4,036 cases had been diagnosed since the beginning of the pandemic. And we've unfortunately had 150 deaths um, so that number is still creeping up a little bit. These are charts the state's putting out. Um, and you notice that as um, Dr. Phil mentioned, there are more women um, than men that have actually had one dose of the vaccine administered. Um, and that's a little bit troubling, but it's probably not terribly surprising. Um, this is the age breakdown and as you can see in the state, um, this number over here, individuals with at least one dose of the vaccine is approximately 74.8% uh, of the total population that's 75 plus. And the numbers up above corresponds to about 52.7% of the people in the 65 to 74 year old age group. Um, so we're getting there. So these are people that have had at least one dose, either one dose or two. I did this um, just about an hour ago. It's extracted from something else the state puts out um, on Thursdays. And this is for every municipality in the state, all 351 of them. I extracted the ones just for the town of Plymouth. And you can see the age groups, uh, the population in the town of Plymouth. And I highlighted bolding the ones that are 75 plus and the 65 to 74. Um, about the oldest age group, the 75 plus or 8% of our population in the town, about 5,000 people. Um, those that have had one dose or more is 3,919. That's about 78%. Um, those that are fully vaccinated in that age group is 1,884. That's about 37% of the group. Um, and then the next age group, the slightly younger ones, 8,393, it's about 13% of our population. 4,266 have had at least one dose. That's about 51% of the total population in that age group. The others are lower, but they are not yet eligible unless they fought, fell into the groups such as the, um, the providers that are working in emergency services um, and hospital workers. That's why there's some there as well. This is the Plymouth County data for the same sort of thing. Um, and you can see it's spread across all the different age groups. 
the total in Plymouth County was about 22% of the total population um, that's actually been vaccinated. So I'm going to stop the share there um, so I don't run over my time too much. Um, and I'll give you some more information at the end. I um, mean, I'll be certainly happy to answer questions for anybody that has any. But thank you, Matt. Thank you, Barry, and thank you for what you and the Board of Health are doing uh, for the town of Plymouth. As you can tell, the numbers are getting better, and that's, that's terrific news. Uh, again, any uh, questions on our medical segment that we just completed, please send us an email to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. Now we're going to move on to our educational uh, segment which with Dr. Stacy Rogers, who's the Director of Special, Special Education for the Plymouth Public Schools. Hey, Stacy, how are you? Hi, Matt. How are you? Good, good, thanks. Um, so I wanted to kind of just start with, with saying that the schools have been really, really busy this spring. Um, we're preparing um, and we're very, very excited to be preparing for our students to fully return to us um, with our elementary starting on March 29th. Um, we've been busy reconfiguring classrooms, bringing furniture out of storage, um, and preparing our teachers and our staff to make sure that everybody um, is safe for a great spring. Um, as some of you may know, and if you don't know, on March 9th, Commissioner Riley, who is the, commis the State Commissioner of Education, released new regulatory guidelines regarding a phased timeline for full in-person learning um, for students to start returning to school on a full-time basis. Um, for Plymouth, what that means is that our elementary school students are coming back to us on March 29th. Our middle school students are coming back to us on April 12th. Um, and the school committee um, recently just made an adjustment in their schedule to move up their meeting date of April 5th to March 29th to revisit the conversation with regard to getting our high school students back um, you know, earlier this spring. Families who have been either remote or homeschooled over the last um, school year have the opportunity to return to us on a full-time basis. And any family who did not um, complete the survey um, should reach out to their building principal um, to let them know that their students will be returning. Um, let's see, um, looking ahead. So this, our spring sports schedule, which is a little bit crazy because now we have football in the spring um are in full swing so our student athletes are working really hard um our musical students are back are back working as well so we're very excited about some spring activities as the weather um starts to improve for us we're able to get our kids outside um, my office being across from nathaniel morton um, it's great to see the kids outside um, enjoying some fresh air and um, some academics as well for our summer um, we are working really hard at increasing our opportunities for all students K to 12 um, for some learning and some enrichment activities in partnership with the YMCA. Um, we had a great um, February vacation camp and we're hoping to replicate that over April vacation as well. So we've asked for teachers um, to lend us their expertise over um, the vacations to get our kids um, back into school and back back learning and um, having some social opportunities. Um, and the, uh, the other big announcement from the commissioner most recently is that he anticipates a full return this fall um, with in-person learning across all grade levels. So we're super excited about that. Um, the only other thing I would like to mention as far as the schools is um, we would just like to thank Dr. Popfin and Dr. Trifoletti for their continued support this year. Um, we really could not have managed without your expertise. So. Um, thank you both for providing us with the data and acting as just amazing sounding boards um, for us as we've navigated um, this difficult year. Um, but we feel as though um, we're the light is at the end of the tunnel. So we're heading in a, in a very positive direction. So um, thank you to both of you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. And thank you for what you and the schools have been doing and the kids have been amazing. Uh, you know, with what they've been doing with wearing the mask and being protective of everyone. So thank you for that. And again, if you have any questions on our educational uh, segment, please, again, email us at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org, and we'll take questions at the end of this program. Next up is our C local CPA extraordinaire, Heather Cosby. Heather, a lot going on. Heather. Tell us about it. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Same that to you. That was quite an intro. I appreciate that. 
So, a lot has happened since the last time I was on, which I predicted, uh, on the federal and the state level. So, I'm going to do my best to hit the high points. I know that Mr. Jackman is going to follow up with more details behind me, um, but it, there's a lot of information basically for businesses and individuals to process. So, starting from the state legislation point of view, uh, there was a press release from the Massachusetts General Court last week that indicates that Massachusetts will, in fact, uh, be passing law that that aligns with the federal PPP forgiveness. What this means is that it will save small businesses about $130 million in taxes by making that forgiveness also tax-free on the state level. This was a topic that I had talked about last time I was on. It has not been enacted yet. So there are some timing issues for businesses. If you're a business that was affected and you filed your return and you, you've treated the forgiveness as taxable for the state, you will have to amend your return eventually. Uh, most businesses should have gone on extension waiting for this law to be passed. So that is a big win for small business uh, that is coming down the pipeline. The second item in that uh, legislation for small business that I wanted to highlight is, is the freeze on unemployment rates. What this means for small business is normally all the unemployment that's been paid out would go and adjust your unemployment rate and then the businesses would be effectively paying that back into the system. So they enacted law that will freeze the rates for the next two years so that small businesses aren't absorbing more of this hit uh, as well. Again, this law is in process. I think last I saw it was with, with the House. It passed the House um, unanimously, and it's, it's in the process of being completed. So from the state point of view, we are catching up to the federal legislation, and that's great. Um, moving on to a quick, quick segment on PPP from a federal point of view, I wanted to just highlight the fact that in this last bill, one of the big benefits that they are um, passing is for to really small businesses. If you file a Schedule C and you have no employees, you generally are having a hard time qualifying for any substantial amount of PPP funds. The uh, SBA's rules have been rewritten to allow you to use either your gross income or your net Schedule C income so that you can have an opportunity to qualify for the maximum amount uh, for, a, for a sole proprietor, which would be $20,833 in PPP funds. If you have obtained uh, a, a PPP loan for less than this, you're going to want to go back and have your documents amended. If you didn't qualify, you're going to want to go back to your bank and go under these new regulations to qualify. And more importantly, as a part of this law, the PPP application date was moved uh, from March 31st to May 31st to give businesses more time to access these funds. So this is all really great news for the smallest businesses that quite honestly can be the most severely affected in their day-to-day -day struggles for payment. So look at this, follow up with your own accountants and your bankers to make sure you have looked at all the options available to you. So the new law that passed. Rescue Act. I, you know what? I give up on all the names. I'm going to be honest. There's too many. But I want to go through. There's a lot of information in this law. There is information that goes back to 2020s taxes, 2021, 2022. It's, it's, it's expansive. So for the purposes of timely information, I want to point, go through the uh, recovery rebate. So this would be a third round payment. It's the $1,400 that you're hearing about in the, in the news. It is different, um, and the way that it's different is that it includes children, college-age children, that were excluded from the prior two payments. Everybody, everybody who qualifies is $1,400 each, so that's a big change and a lot more money. But what it also did is it lowered the income threshold to who will qualify. So that means less people will qualify, but they will receive more money, which is helping the people that probably need it the most, and that's great. From a tax strategy point of view, this is where it gets a little tricky. Believe it or not, people in 2020 actually did make more money than they made in 2019. If you need to, you need to look at your taxes and not file your 2020 tax return if, in fact, the income limit change causes you to qualify for less money on your stimulus, you're going to want to extend your 2020 return. So I'm encouraging taxpayers to look at this and maybe look at it in a lot more detail than you would have thought. Don't rush to do your 2020 tax return and submit it for this reason. And the second reason has to do with the unemployment tax benefit that was just given. So moving on to that tax uh, law, the first $10,200 of unemployment benefits received last year for 2020 are tax-free. 
this is awesome, this is great. The problem is they just enacted this law in March and people have been filing tax returns. So the IRS has been scrambling to put together a procedure. The, the tax software is not updated for this rule. They have started to issue some general information, but they have given no formal guidance or what are called regulations that they issue, which provides the interpretive law um, guidance for us to use to actually enact the law. So we also have software that's not updated. So the IRS issued a statement that literally said, don't do anything yet, just wait for us to give guidance. So what this means, if you've already filed your 2020 tax return and you received unemployment and it was fully taxed, do not amend your return. You are going to wait for the IRS to see if they can figure out how to automatically make this correction and give you your refund. Secondly, if you have not filed your tax return, don't file it yet. You need to wait to understand that the software you're using or the software your preparer is using is updated for this procedure. Lastly, I don't know on the state side what states are going to also be enacting this benefit um, for the state. So right now this benefit is a federal tax benefit only, not a Massachusetts benefit yet. I don't know what the discussions are on the state level on that. So, so those are the two items that are really important that you actually need to stop and take a pause. Um, there's less than a month of tax season left and, and this is an incredible amount of information for preparers and taxpayers uh, to try and crunch and do the best thing for their accountants. I'm, I'm still hopeful maybe the extent, they'll give an extension on the time. Some of the other things that um, are coming out, this is for 2021. And this is timely because the IRS has been tasked with issuing child tax credits pre ahead of time, an advance on your 2021 child tax credit. They, they've been instructed to issue that from July to December. Some taxpayers may not want that tax credit given to them in advance because they use it to pay for their business taxes, things it like that. The other three, that so there's going to be a quicker. system in place that will um, allow you to opt out of it, but it's of course not designed yet. So that's an issue. Um, you know, there's a lot more information. Those are the big ones. I think there'll be more information coming out. These are the things that like this week and the next four weeks you need to know about. So I wanted to, uh, to, to do that. I'm, I'm, I know people have questions whether or not they can even put them together to send in. I'm happy to try and answer them. It's just an ongoing change and I'm hoping Mr. Jackman can continue my discussion and continue to clarify. But thanks for having me, Matt. Thank you so much, Heather. Great information again. And yes, you're right, Heather. The, the House last week at the state level passed the PPP um, legislation uh, to not tax uh, businesses for that 5%. The Senate is expected to take it up at their formal session tomorrow, March 18th, and it's expected to pass, and then it'll move on to the governor and become law. So stay tuned for that. So thank you so much, Heather. Now we're going to move on to, as, as Heather just mentioned, the district director for Bill Keating, Congressman Bill Keating, is Michael Jackman. Mike, how are you doing? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Representative Moratori, I can tell you're not Steve Trafletti because Steve would definitely have a green tie on today. But wait, I have a green tie. Parody, this so. is green. This is green. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record. <laughs> not as green. Not as green as mine. No, not as green but as yours. In any event, um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, uh, there is a lot, as Heather mentioned, there's a lot in the um, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, the She hit most of the highlights, the uh, economic impact payment. Uh, one thing I would mention is unemployment, the pandemic unemployment, and which is for uh, self-employed and gig workers and uh, the uh, federal stipend of $300, not $400, $300, has been extended to September 6th. So folks who are still um, on unemployment and, and, and unable to return to work because of the uh, shutdowns Matthew with one um, are still able to uh, collect, collect those, uh, that, those uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, a few other things I'll just mention quickly, the child care tax credit has been increased and actually will be coming out as a payment to qualifying families starting in July. So we'll have more information about that. Um, child care itself, the, the, the block grant program that comes from the federal government to the state has been uh, increased. So hopefully some child care places that were unable to stay open or had f f uh, fin financial problems during the uh, pandemic will be able to uh, get some of those benefits. Rental assistance is a big increase in that funding, which is going to help not only renters, but also landlords 
um, because we know that uh, folks who are, have been able to make their rent payments, that impacts the um, owners of the buildings as well. So there'll be an increase in the raft funding for that. Uh, food security, the SNAP benefits will be extended and increased. Um, Rep Replanato referred to it briefly. Um, there's a, the state is using some of the funding it got from the federal government, the CDC, through this American Rescue Plan to do some vaccine equity outreach. Um, I think it's $27 million to reach out to some uh, communities that um, may be reluctant to take, take the vaccine or aren't, aren't getting messages uh, or information as readily as other folks. So we're very excited about that. Um, the, uh, Heather also mentioned PPP. There's an increase in the PPP funding. So the, there'll be additional payroll protection program uh, grants and loans going out and, a, and an additional $15 billion in the econo economic injury disaster loan. So there's a lot in this, in this bill. One thing I do want to mention is that, um, which the Congressman highlighted in some of his press statements uh, recently, is the, uh, the direct funding for uh, counties, municipalities, and the state. Um, we're very excited that Plymouth will be receiving over $9 million directly uh, fr from this program. Plymouth County, as folks may recall, got some funding from the CARES Act. They'll be getting even more funding through the American Rescue Plan, and that's coming directly from the federal government, over $100 million there. And additionally, the, the, the money for the schools, so the schools can reopen, can buy some PPP or make uh, renovations to make schools safer. Uh, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funding the, the Plymouth will be receiving about $6.5 million in that funding. So there's a lot out there. There's a lot going on with taxes. The only thing I will say is uh, folks who are having issues with their tax return from 2019, unfortunately still the IRS is behind in processing the paper returns. Um, do feel free to reach out to our office. A lot of, had a lot of folks reach out to us wondering what's going on with their return. We are trying to work with the IRS to expedite that, but um, it's been unfortunately a slow process. So I, I, I guess the big message, which I should have uh, started with is if you haven't filed yet, as Heather mentioned, um, please do all, all you can to file electronically. It'll be a big help. It'll make your processing much quicker. If you have um, uh, healthcare, uh, a premium tax credit that you receive from the state this year through the Affordable Care Act, Make sure you include the correct forms. Um, that's going to make your processing go a lot quicker too. So, uh, I think that's all I have for now, Matt. But I'm looking forward to any questions folks might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. And as Mike said, any any questions you may have uh, for the congressman and his office, please email us at plymouthinfo at pactv.org, and we'll get those questions asked at the end of the segment. Now we're going to move on to our director of the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Amy Naples, to give us an update on what's happening in the chamber. Hey, Amy. Good afternoon. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Same to you. Um, thank you, of course, for the great updates. And Heather, thank you for sharing the great news for our small businesses, PPPs, and tax strategies. Um, always just a wealth of information you all are. Um, so it's always a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for including me. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about today. First being is that Plymouth is a recipient of the Rapid Recovery Grant, which is in collaboration with the Town of Plymouth, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation and the Chamber. Um, and this is a spinoff from our Plymouth Recovery Task Force. So we will act as a sounding board um, for this grant and we're very excited about this opportunity. The basis really is to help identify areas of recovery needed for our downtown specifically. So um, I'll, I'll, like other grants, um, you've received money, but this one is a little different. We are receiving a consultant, which is very exciting. So we'll be working closely with a consultant um, to help us dig deeper, not only to find solutions, but identify areas that we can expand upon, working with the businesses in the downtown. Um, honestly, just having an outside perspective will be very helpful and I think will put us um, ahead of our game in terms of recovery. So um, we are very excited about that opportunity um, and the potential strategies that will be able to help us create a sustainable, eco 
sustainable economic environment for all businesses and industries in the downtown that we actually haven't really thought of before. Um, and then in addition, um, the chamber, as you know, is always working on um, small business support local initiatives. And today being St. Patrick's Day, we did release our Get Your Irish on Restaurant and Sweet Treats Guide. So you can visit our Facebook page for that complete listing. Um, our Facebook page is just Plum Theory Chamber as well as our Instagram um, stories. And so if you're looking for that corned beef and cabbage, we have you covered and some good minty treats. So check that out. Um, as always, we're trying to support our local businesses. And in doing so also today, we have a cash mob from two to four, and we have announced the location, which is Healthy Appetites, and they are located in Camelot Park in Plymouth, 11 Raphael Road. From two to four, we'll be there. We ask you to um, bring a friend, a coworker, whatever it may be. Um, the basis of this initiative is to ring, a red, ring registers and of course gain some exposure for that local business. Um, so everyone's invited to join us um, and celebrate this great small business located in Camelot Park and the chamber crew will be there from two to four, but certainly pop in and visit them anytime. Um, the only rule we have is that we ask you to simply make a purchase. And um, that's the basis of our cash mob. And then it is, I mean, it's a crazy week. We also have Local Eats Week happening, um, which starts on Friday, March 19th, and will run till um, March 26th. Participating restaurants are offering some awesome, awesome specials and deals. Um, many of the specials include deals for $20.21. So you can find all of the participating restaurants at localeatsweek.com. And of course, um, plumbuschamber.com for to stay up to date on all the chamber happenings. And remember this St. Patrick's Day, keep your green local. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Amy, for your update. We appreciate that and appreciate all you, uh, you do for our business community here in Plymouth. Uh, now we're gonna move on back to our state representative, Kathy Lenatra. Kathy, yesterday we were on a call with Secretary Sutters. We do this on a every other week basis. And she talked briefly about updates on regional collaborations. Uh, can you give us a little update on what's happening? Forgot about the mute. <laughs> Yes, we do. I enjoy those calls, man. I'm sure you do as well. They do keep us updated. So in this community, we've all been looking at Kingston Collection and working very hard um, and Dr. Potvin has as well. I was actually at the Kingston Town Hall the other day and saw that they're all prepared. They're ready to go. They have their freezers. And when it was discussed with Secretary Sutters, they're reviewing it now. So we are being a little optimistic with that um, as they're starting to bring in new doses to Massachusetts. So let's all keep working towards that. That's our goal is to have something more regional to us, to Plymouth and Kingston and surrounding towns. And the Kingston collection has been worked on extensively. And I know there's a lot of us on this call that would be very happy to see that come to fruition. Okay, any other updates, Kathy? So I can just update you. I mean, there was a lot to unpack today. Some great information. Amy, I'm all excited to go out to lunch. I'm wearing my green dress. My husband is home today. So after this, we'll be heading down to Plymouth and I'm glad you announced where the cash mob was because I'm also on that keto diet. So that's a great place to go. Um, healthy appetites, they do a great business there. So I'm just gonna update quickly. I know we've heard a lot of numbers today, but just to give you a couple of the vaccine numbers. So as of yesterday, 2,991,670 doses have been shipped to Massachusetts. 2,610,479 doses have been administered, and that's 87.3% of doses shipped have been administered. 946,306 people are fully vaccinated for both doses, Moderna and Pfizer's and one J&J, um, &J, Johnson and Johnson. So just quickly to update you on the remaining groups, March 22nd, residents 60 plus and certain workers, restaurant, grocery and medical supply chain, will be oh, also public works, utility, sanitation, public health and court system and funerals. So that's a long list. They will be eligible starting March 22nd, April 5th, residents 55 plus and residents with one comorbidity. 
And April 19th is the general public. So after April 19th, general public ages 16 years and older. So I am optimistic that we're gonna be on the other side of this sooner than later. It was great to be with all of you today and to see all your voices. And thanks, Matt, for inviting me. Thank you, Kathy, appreciate that. Uh, next week's lineup, joining Steve Trefoletti, who will be back hosting next week, Ken and myself, will be uh, Dr. Mark Wilson, who's a uh, professor emeritus at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Sarah Cloud, who's the Director of Behavioral Health Social Work at BID. Scott Williams, the principal at West Elementary School. And Stephen Cole, Executive Director of the Plymouth Regional Development Foundation. Now we have a couple of questions that have come in. I'm gonna ask uh, Stacy Rogers to take this question, please. Dr. Rogers, uh, the question came in is, what, what was the response from families to the survey about going back to school? And were there any consistent questions uh, coming out of that from families? Sure, so I'm just gonna get my cheat sheet so I don't misspeak. Um, several surveys were sent out to families um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and those survey results were um, reviewed at the school committee, the last school committee meeting, which was Monday, which was, I think, the 15th. Um, there were several um, themes that were that were discussed. And while we didn't go over every every single parent response, um, you know, it it varied a little bit. Let me just find sort of you know, obviously there were some parents that were concerned and there were some parents who were not. So the survey was a little bit, a little bit mixed um, and as well as the staff surveys. And while most, I would say primarily staff and parents were in favor of students returning to school. Um, some of the other students, especially seniors were a little bit, um, I would say more reluctant um, because there's a lot um, obviously that happens for seniors at the end and they were worried about either getting sick or having to quarantine. But in general, um, the survey results were favorable um, for a full return to school. And the second question that came in is uh, for Heather. Heather, what's the easiest way to file an extension to give folks additional time? So the easiest way to file an extension, it's a form 4868. Um, what you have to do to file an extension though is you have to figure out if you owe taxes or not. And that involves you basically doing 90% of your tax return. So an extension is deemed valid if you pay your taxes on time. The extension gives you time to actually wrap up that filing. Um, so when filing an extension, you have to, you have to calculate that. You, I think you can file an extension maybe directly on the IRS website. I know you can do it directly on the Mass Tax Connect website uh, or use a tax practitioner, or uh, I would do not recommend doing anything via mail. You used to be able to, you, you can mail it in, but I just wouldn't recommend it. Um, so I would, I would look to do that. I'd, I'd reach out to the local accountants as well and other uh, tax preparing offices, but be prepared to have 90% of your information on hand in order to understand uh, if you owe money or not for April 15th. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now we're gonna go back to uh, our panelists and just give us a quick last minute thoughts. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Phil Trifoletti. Dr. Phil, last minute thoughts? Yes, thanks, Matt. Uh, so this is where the pleading part comes in, uh, as Ken pointed to at the beginning of the broadcast. Um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, you know, we don't have herd immunity yet. Uh, you know, you have to continue to try to do the right things. What are the right things? I think you should avoid, you know, having indoor gatherings without masks. So whether that's at home, uh, home gatherings, or whether it's somewhere else, you know, think about that, that you want to try to minimize that. You know, I think doing things outdoors is generally very safe. Um, so it's the indoor gatherings that you should really focus on. Um, you may be aware there's a, a lot more going on in terms of the variants. You know, Dr. Potvin explained some of that here in Massachusetts. Uh, and so um, there, some of the experts are quite concerned about the, you know, what the impact the variants might have over the coming weeks. And so as we have larger larger percentages of variants here in the United States and, and the possibility of a surge, you know, that sort of brings us back to, you know, doing all the right things in terms of the mitigation strategies, wearing masks, social distancing, et cetera. So, uh, so I also plead the case, please just keep doing the right things. If you haven't got your shot, you know, get in line, 
for getting your shot and uh, stay well. I hope everyone has a nice day. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dr. Phil, appreciate that. Dr. Barry Pothman. Yes, um, thanks, Matt. I think I probably should bring up something that the governor mentioned today and it was brought up by the Department of Public Health officials yesterday. Um, it's a positive sort of thing, so it's worth emphasizing. Um, within about 24 hours, they fully expect that there will now be about 1 million people in this state that are fully vaccinated. The goal is 4.1 million, but we've certainly made a lot of headway, uh, but there's still further to go. Just to go on about the variants a little bit, um, there's a third surge going on in quite a few countries in Europe. Um, some of the countries have actually put in place more new curfews and lockdowns to try to control the infection spread. It's apparently being caused by the new variants, also by relaxed restrictions and widespread flouting of the safety procedures. And just to join with everybody else, I'm pleading, I'm begging everyone uh, please, please, please remember that you have to still wear a mask. You have to be cautious. You have to be vigilant. And I think Dr. Fauci put it in a in way that probably a lot of football fans would appreciate. You really shouldn't spike the ball when you get to the five yard line. It just doesn't work. Um, and it just prolongs everything. So um, please, please try to do the best you can and put up with it for just a little bit longer. Thank you, Matt. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, now uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Stacy Rogers. Any last minute thoughts, Dr. Rogers? Um, just again, we're super excited to have our, our students back. As the commissioner said, there's really no, no substitute for full in-person learning. So we're excited to have our kids back. If there's any questions with regard to the survey, uh, I'm happy to get additional information. Um, or to, sh to share those results with anybody who is interested. And they can email me at srogers at plymouth.k12.ma.us and I'm happy to share um, the slide deck that was um, displayed at the last school committee with anybody who'd like to um, to look at some of that additional data. Thank you so much. Heather. Unmuting myself. There we go. Uh, so I just want to I want to quickly hit on two areas so people know it exists. In the law, there is there is relief for health uh, health premiums insurance. So, if you are affected in paying Cobra, starting this year, there's a Cobra tax credit, so that will help offset that cost of paying for health insurance premiums. So, if you have Cobra, just know there's something there you need to look at. Secondly, for last year, if you took an advance on your health insurance premium tax credit, then and and you have to pay it back. You don't have to pay it back for 2020. So again, if this is something that's normally a part of your tax return, know there's relief. And the third thing, discharge of student loans from December 31st, 2020 through January 1st, 26. Five years of student loan discharge, not taxable income. Something to look into for yourself. If these things are a part of your life, go look, get more information. Uh, so good to see everybody. Always wonderful information. I cannot wait for my fourth grader to be back in school. So exciting. Thank you, everybody. I'm sure then you took the survey then for the schools. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Mike Jackman. Mike, great news from the state, county, and Plymouth perspective from getting all this money. Uh, thank the congressman for, for us for that. And uh, any last minute thoughts, Mike? Yeah, just uh, because it is tax season, just to go along with um, Heather, uh, <clears throat> a lot of folks don't realize that they might qualify for free e-filing. I can't stress enough, people should electronically file if at all possible. The IRS free file, it's, it's on their website. Um, you can connect to one of the tax prep softwares and, and if you qualify your income, I think it's, if it's below $72,000, you qualify for that. So I would urge everyone to take uh, advantage of that because it's, it's the quickest way to get your information to the IRS and a uh, quickest way to get your refund too. So uh, please sit, check that out. And I look forward to saying hello to everyone again in a few weeks. Great advice. Thanks, Mike. Amy, any last minute thoughts? So I wanted to notice that I'm hearing frequently that um, our local businesses are busy on the weekends, which is just so great to hear. But I want to strongly encourage viewers to patronize those businesses midweek. 
um, order takeout, pop into one of our amazing shops or schedule your personal appointments midweek if you can. Um, it'd be great to sprinkle that out throughout the week for them. Um, as always, stay well and support local. Thanks very much, Amy. Representative Lenatra, any last minute thoughts from you? I'm just briefly gonna say we enter that next phase, which would be phase four, step one on Monday, March 22nd as well. And that means that indoor and outdoor stadiums, arenas and ballparks, including Fenway Park, Gillette and the TD Garden included, will reopen at 12% capacity. Um, as always, we wanna practice our social distancing and wearing our masks as stated. We don't, I love that. Don't wanna spike the ball at the five yard line. I'm gonna say that about 10 times today to my family. <laughs> so again, a pleasure to see you all. Shop local, right, Amy? Shop local. I'm looking forward to having lunch down in Plymouth. Beautiful day for a walk down on the waterfront as well. Thanks, Matt, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, and thank, for join thank you for joining us today, Kathy. Really appreciate that. And now we're gonna wrap it all up with our chairman of the board of selectmen for the town of Plymouth, Ken, for Ken Tavares. Thank you, Matt. I wanted to mention that last night at the Selectman's meeting, the board approved a number of licenses for outdoor dining. That's a really good sign that uh, spring is on its way. And I want to thank everyone that's been working so hard to have a setup that's going to be attractive and also uh, serve uh, all of those that are waiting to eat outside uh, once, once again. Uh, also, uh, I want to note, uh, Representative uh, Muratori, that there's been a lot of talk about your tie, uh, Barry's uh, green shirt, uh, Mike's uh, uh, very, very fancy tie, and uh, uh, also the fact that uh, Rep. Lenatra is going out. Uh, I didn't want you to think that those of us in the Tavares household weren't celebrating St. Patrick's Day since my wife has a large portion of her bloodline in it. So a friend of mine dropped by just to say hello. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ken. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Um, and thank you for the board and, and for what they are doing uh, to help our businesses in the downtown area. Uh, we are looking forward to spring. I just want to thank our panelists today for joining us. I want to thank PAC TV again for allowing us to do our 90th show. Today was our 90th show, and we want to thank them for all they've been doing this last year uh, to get this trusted information out to all of you. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you next Wednesday at noontime. Thank you for watching.